Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today is going to be one of those unplanned videos. I was doing a run-of-the-mill repair on this Amstrad CPC-6128 right behind me when I found some interesting behavior that I thought would be worth of a video. I don't know if this is going to be one of those five-minute quick-fix videos or if it's going to be a full episode, but let's dive right into it. So this is the Amstrad CPC-6128 that I was just restoring. And there was nothing really special about it. That's why I wasn't even making a video. I think one of the sockets was a little corroded. So I actually removed the socket and put a new one and turned it on and it was working great. So great. I moved on to testing the drive and that's when weird things started happening. So notice I don't even have the power, the 12 volt connector connected anywhere. So the, the, the drive is not powered. But when I tried typing had to access the disk, I got this. And that was weird enough that made me pause and decide to start the video because it could turn out to be an interesting repair. So I wonder if that happens with any disk related commands. Like what if I tell it to go to drive B? Interesting. Very interesting. From seeing this, I would guess it's some kind of problem with the disk ROM. The Amstrad CPC-6128 has two physical ROM chips, one that's 32 kilobytes and contains the OS and the BASIC, and a 16 kilobyte one with AMSDOS, which contains the functionality that allows interfacing with the floppy disk drive. So the easiest thing to do would be to remove the AMSDOS ROM and try a new one, or if I don't have any spares, take it out, read it in the EEPROM programmer, and compare the data to the dumps available. Unfortunately, the ROMs on the Amstrad CPC boards are not socketed, so that's a bit of a barrier. I don't mind too much desoldering them, but I have the tools and the experience, and even so, every so often I'll break a trace or pull a pad. So desoldering a chip just to see if it could potentially be bad isn't something I would recommend. But since this Amstrad appears to be otherwise working fine, we have other ways to check if the ROM is correct. We can write a program that runs on the Amstrad, loads the data of the Amstrad's ROM, and compares it against one that we know is good. And this brings me to an area where the Sinclair's that X Spectrum puts the Amstrad CPC to shame. Diagnostics Programs. The ZX Spectrum has ZX Diagnostics, written by Brendan Alford and Dylan Smith. ZX Diagnostics is a wonderful set of tests that checks for general hardware issues, RAM faults, incorrect ROMs, and gives all sorts of really accurate information. If you've seen some of my ZX Spectrum repair videos, that's a test I often pull out to check. On the Amstrad CPC, on the other hand, we have Quick and Dirty RAM Test by Gerald. Literally, that's how it's called. Don't get me wrong, it's super useful to detect RAM issues and I've used it for many years, but it's so limited compared to the Spectrum equivalent. One project I've been wanting to do for years is to create a full feature diagnostic suite for the Amstrad, just like ZX Diagnostics. Unfortunately, for one reason or another, I can never find the time to create that project, so I just make do with the tests that are available there right now. But this time, I would really like to have something that checks that the ROMs are not corrupt. So maybe I'll use this as an opportunity to start in that project. I pulled out my old Zach's Z80 book and Amstrad hardware reference books and set up a basic development environment using an external editor and assembling and running with the WinApe emulator. And then I spent a few hours working on it. I hadn't done any non-trivial Z80 assembly programming in 30 plus years, so I was really rusty, but it was really, really fun getting back into it. In the end, I created a really simple program that looks through all the ROMs, computes their CRC, and checks them against a table of known standard system ROMs. If all goes well, it simply prints their name. But if I find the ROM that doesn't match exactly one of the system ROMs, it flags it as unknown, and then we'll know that we should replace it or check it more closely. The last thing we need to do is load that program in the Amstrad we're repairing. But since the disk drive isn't working, we need another method. What I'll do is create a snapshot with WinApe directly and then load it into the Dandinator cartridge. This allows me to just plug it in, select it from the menu, and there you go. It's loaded and ready to go. So let's try it. Okay, detecting. Okay, it detects the load one correctly. Basic as correct. And now that's the disk. Oh, so this is the disk ROM, the AMSDOS ROM, and it reports that the contents of that ROM are fine. So whatever problem we're getting here, it's not because the ROM is corrupted. We can go look elsewhere and we didn't have to desolder this. 
There are multiple parts of the computer involved in the controlling of the floppy disk drive. Obviously, we have the ROM itself, but the main one is the floppy disk controller and also this data separator plus some discrete logic around it. But those are the main parts. So one of those things has to, has to be failing, it has to be the problem. And I noticed that there is some corrosion around the floppy disk controller. So you can see some right there. And I even cleaned those pins myself a little bit with um, a fiberglass pen. And on the other side, yeah, let's have a better look at this one. Yeah, that looks like there's some corrosion there. So, I mean, this is not socketed. So I don't think that corrosion is causing any shorts or anything like that. It wouldn't hurt to desolder this. I know I was trying to avoid desoldering things, but since this is one of the prime candidates, I could desolder it and without it, see if we're still getting that same weird pattern. Uh, normally when this fails, what I've seen happen is that the ROM tries to send a, a disk command and it, you know this doesn't respond, so it just returns bad command. So it would be interesting to see if without this chip, we get the bad command or we still get that weird screen fill, which then maybe means it's some of the logic leading up to this. Yeah, look at that. That's worse than I realized. I mean, it could even conceivably be making contact between the pins. So I don't see that in any of the other chips. It's just this one in particular. I wonder if like some liquid gets spilled in there or something. So yeah, it's definitely a good thing to remove it, clean it well, socket it, and then we can go from there. Oh, wow. I guess the corrosion was enough to maybe have bad contacts in that leg. That was a lot worse than I expected. So the board itself cleaned up really well. There's nothing that looks bad in there at all. This also looks really good. By the way, I didn't show it, but I looked at the back of the board and everything else looks great or everything really looks great. There was nothing highly corroded or there were no botch wires of any kind or any signs of a previous repair. So that's always good. I wonder what got that chip so bad. So let's go ahead and try it uh, without the floppy disk controller, just to see if it behaves the same way. And since I don't want to put it back in the case, I'm just going to short the switch connector like that. So whenever we give it power, it will turn on. I do need to connect the keyboard ribbon cable so we can type cat. And let's try it. Okay. Interesting that the ROM can initialize without the floppy disk controller in place. That's good to know. And now I suspect I should get a bad command. Oh, interesting. So this is coming from something before the floppy disk controller. Otherwise, we should have definitely gotten a bad command. It can't really do anything at all. So maybe one of the chip enable signals even to read from this is messing up with something else. Very interesting. I, we need to have a look at the schematics to see what's going on. There's actually not much at all in between the floppy disk controller and the rest of the system. So since I didn't see anything really obvious, I decided to take a working Amstrad CPC 6128 from my collection, remove the floppy disk controller, turn it on, try to access the disk, and same thing. The screen was filled with the same pattern. So I must have misremembered when you get the bad command. Maybe it's only when you get a bad ROM, or maybe it's a faulty floppy disk controller, but not completely dysfunctional like this one. So it's a good thing to know for future repairs anyway. So now we know that without a floppy disk controller at all, you get the full screen filled with that red pattern. Okay, so now that we know that, let's put a working floppy disk controller. Uh, this is coming out of another computer, so I know this one is working. And let's put it here. Let's see if the disk commands work. I don't even have the floppy disk hooked up or powered or anything. I just want to see does it respond to those commands. Oh. Oh, so this is extra weird. 
We're not getting the basic prompt. And what else is wrong in this screen? <laughs> ISP. So there are some links on the board um, right here. And those control which brand name it says in there. So by default, if they're not connected, this should say Amstrad. The fact that it says ISP is that I think it's the PPI is somehow reading the wrong values from there. So that's interesting. And then it's locking up. How weird. So this is without the floppy disk controller in, and I just want to check that there's no continuity between them, right? Okay. And do they somehow get connected when I put in the chip? That would be super weird, but uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't expect them to, but let's see. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay. So I was having so much fun with the Z80 assembly programming, something that I hadn't done in so many years that I couldn't help myself and I continue working on that a little bit more. I added support to check for faulty RAM in the upper bank of the Amstrad CPC 6128, so the upper 64K. That's something that I didn't see any other utility that was doing it before. And that's why I had to do that weird bank switching trick that I talked about in a previous video and then running the regular RAM test. So this test will take care of that. And uh, this is funny because it's actually, it's kind of turning this project into the Amstrad Diagnostics ROM that I was hoping existed at the beginning of this video. So if nothing else, this got me motivated to get that started. So let's go ahead and try the RAM and ROM tests again. This is the, by the way, this is the improved Amstrad Diagnostics ROM that I made yesterday. And we're doing this without the floppy disk controller. Okay, so it goes through the low RAM tests first. Those pass. And then upper RAM also passes. It checks the ROMs. Yeah. Yeah, so everything's... Oh, interesting. CRCT type 2. Yeah, that's one of the... One of the things that I decided to throw in there as well. Okay, so there's nothing apparently wrong with the floppy disk controller out. Obviously, we're not having any floppy disk controller tests yet, although I would like to have those at some point. So now I'm going to put in the working. Again, I keep saying working because it's really bizarre that things change for the worse when I put it in. And let's run the tests again. Okay, low RAM is fine. Oh, and it hangs in here. So it doesn't even print a CRT type and it doesn't say success or failure. So right now the code is hanging. So for this, we're doing some in operations and we also are doing some, I, I suspect the firmware is doing some in operations and some ports to read the state of the links. So maybe there is something Somehow putting this in, some of the logic around it, some of the logic that decides where the ports go is faulty somehow and is causing things to hang. I don't know. It seems like a stretch, but this is a really bizarre and interesting um, failure state. So I'm, I'm glad I'm making a video about this because here's the other thing. I suspect that what we're seeing right now is completely independent of what we've done so far. It looked like they were working before and then we're getting that red screen and that was mostly because of our um, floppy disk controller probably just not working at all. So will it run a game? Oh, we don't even get the menu for the Dandinator. Oh, wow. But if I remove this, do we get the menu? We do. And let's just see if it works fine. Let's try Gun Fright. Yeah. So I had to think about this for a little while. And this is my current theory. The reason things get messed up when we put a 
floppy disk controller that we know it's working, it's because it's the logic of chip select that is faulty somehow. Chip select is the signal that normally enables a chip and it tells it you can put your state on the data bus or whatever, uh, pretty much do your thing. So if we have no chip in here and we have a faulty chip select signal, then it doesn't matter that that signal is ignored. But as soon as we put a working floppy disk controller and we randomly tell it to, oh yeah, do your thing, put some data in the bus, it's going to wreak havoc. It's going to mess anything. I'm surprised that as many things work as they do. And that's pretty easy to check. Uh, we can look at the signals themselves and follow their logic. So chip select on the floppy disk controller is pin number four, which is this one right here. And interestingly, there is some activity. I don't know if there's supposed to be activity or not. Um, I should check with a working version of this. I suppose it's always, a com sometimes there's a combination of chip select and output enable. So that might be it, but let's keep tracing this one. Looking at the schematics, this chip select goes through an a NAND gate, and that's this one right here. And it should be this. Yeah, that looks very similar. And the inputs to that on one end is, so this should be bit eight on the address bus. And yeah, that looks about right. And then the other one is an output from a an inverter. Oh, and we're getting nothing there. No, I mean, worse than nothing. We're getting this floating line at one volt that, I mean, it could mean that really is one volt and it could mean that it's just floating. So when we try to do an end of the two things, this could be kind of random. So that fits the theory really well. So the inverter is actually this one over here which I'm even noticing right away that it has a little bit of rust in there. So maybe it was affected just like the floppy disk controller, maybe it had some problems. So anyway, that bit coming into the NAND gate is supposed to be coming from bit 12, which is one of the outputs of, yeah, look at that, that one is floating. Okay, so what about the input? Although really it shouldn't output that. Okay, as long as it has the, so this inverter has two sides, has four inverters in one side and four inverters on the other side. And each of the sides has an enable bit. So, and it's also active low. So if it's high, then they could be anything. And bit, pin one, okay, so pin one is low. So it really means that all these inverters, which these are the inputs, the outputs are out there, should be, outputting um, things correctly, but we're getting that. And what about the input? The input is supposed to be eight. Okay, that's reasonable activity. What about another output on this side? So 12 is an output, 14 is an output. Yeah, that doesn't look good either. And 16, Doesn't look too good. And 18, I think, is the other one. That one seems maybe okay. But yeah, I would think that this inverter over here could very easily be the cause of the problems that we're having. So, and it's, I see that it's also a little rusty. So let's go ahead and replace it. Again, there's a fair bit of corrosion there. So I suppose it's possible that the whole chip is failing because of that. Um, they certainly were together along with the other failing chip. All right, let's pop it out. So it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. It was kind of tucked away in there. There's definitely some corrosion or maybe even just, yeah, a little bit of corrosion there, but nothing too bad.
just to be sure, let's check the octal inverter on the EEPROM programmer. So we can run the tests directly from the software here. And oh wow, every single gate in there is failing. Yeah, so this was probably the problem. So here I have another 74, uh, 240. So another, this is like a octal inverter or something like that. And uh, let's see if that helps with things. Since I have a camera set up on the oscilloscope, let's check anyway that we are getting a better signal. So this was pin 12 that we were not getting anything before. There we go. That looks pretty good to me. Okay, so I don't know if that fixed everything or not, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. Let's see what happens now when we try to use this commands. Okay, let's try it. All right, this is already better than it was before. We're getting a, a basic prompt, which before we were locking up. And okay, we can type, and if we do cat. Okay, this is great. I think, I think we're there. Now we just need to put a floppy disk drive and power it up and actually we might as well do it right now so we can make sure that everything is working. But yes, um, it looks like it was both the floppy disk controller and that inverter. Okay, we have everything connected, the power cable and the floppy disk drive. I'm going to put in a disk and see if we can access it. Of course, I haven't tried this floppy disk drive. There we go, first try. That's awesome. Okay, I think really that was it. Those two ICs, which are kind of out of the way. They're not usually things that fail. So that made for a you know, different and hopefully interesting repair. It turns out I couldn't just stop working on the diagnostics program and I had to do some more stuff with it. One interesting bit I thought it would be worth touching on briefly is the lower RAM tests. Detecting and reporting faulty RAM is somewhat tricky because by definition, you can't use any RAM in your code. That means no variables, no stack, meaning no calls of any kind, and not even any display because it's memory mapped on the Amstrad CPC at least. If the tests pass, that's fine because you can then start using all the RAM and move on to other tests, which is exactly what the diagnostics ROM does right now. But if it fails, how do you report a RAM failure without being able to display anything on the screen? And to make things even more difficult, how can you report which chip is actually failing? Some diagnostics programs in other platforms, like the dead test cartridge on the Commodore 64, uses flashes on the screen to report that. It turns out that drawing any kind of graphics is out of the question, but as long as the video chip is working, we can manipulate the colors to convey some information. So the number of flashes indicates the first chip that's failing. Then you can fix that one, run it again, and see a different number of flashes and fix that one. That works, but it's, let's say, less than convenient. A better approach, like the ZX Diagnostics does, or the original quick and dirty test that I used as a starting point, was to time the color changes of the video chip to draw bars on the screen. Each bar represents one of the 8 bits in the data bus, which corresponds to an individual chip, and the color of the bar indicates if the chip is faulty, red, or not, green. That's pretty good, except for one thing. I could never remember if bit 0 was the top or the bottom. I really wanted to label them somehow, so I started exploring the technique of changing the color registers timed perfectly after the vertical sync signal and looking at what other people had done before me, and after a lot of experimentation, I managed to get enough accuracy to render some patterns on the fly. The other breakthrough was to reduce the memory mapped area of the screen to zero and have everything just be a giant border that we can control with the CRT registers. So now when some chips fail, you get some fat labels explaining which bit they correspond to. You have to be 100% precise if you want the screen not to flicker from frame to frame, but it's definitely possible by counting individual cycles of your instructions. One thing I thought it was particularly amusing was how the code to display those numbers and bars changed while I was developing it. The code itself is just a bunch of out instructions writing colors to the CRT controller registers. So initially I wrote just that, a bunch of out instructions. Each out was four cycles and each line was 16 outs wide. So I wrote a lot of outs. That was enough to show me that it was possible, but changing those instructions to write numbers and patterns 
seemed pretty difficult. I even thought I would have to write some kind of Python script to generate the assembly in order to draw those numbers. But then I started using the Z80 compilers directives to make things simpler. I realized that it would be easier to write those instructions as the two bytes of their upcodes because they would fit in a grid. And if you squint enough, you can kind of see the differences between the upcodes of an out C and an out A, and you can modify it. So that was a little better. Then I realized that the compiler also had a defined directive, which is like a macro. So I was able to define WW to be the opcode for out C, which is the color for the number, and BB to be the opcode for out A, the color of the background, and so on, and then write the code by painting letters pretty much. The final touch to make this even more usable was to define the background color as an actual underscore. So now just looking at the code, you can totally see the picture that is going to draw. This was a really fun programming challenge and a perfect example of the crazy things you can do in platforms like these. Between the total control of the hardware and the fact that you know exactly how many cycles each instruction takes, you can do some amazing things. I really miss that kind of determinism in computers. By the way, I put all the code on GitHub and I put a link in the description. So if you're interested in checking it out, go ahead. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Or even if you want to contribute directly to the project, that would be great. So in the end, this was a pretty interesting repair. Whenever one of those small chips on the board goes bad, it usually ends up being a pretty interesting repair because you really need to understand what's going on and what could possibly be causing that, usually a signal that is triggered at the wrong time or something like that. So here was lucky that my first theory was the correct one, but I guess that's payoff for those other repairs where just everything goes wrong and you try one thing after another, after another, after another. I've, I've had some of those, <laughs> we all have. It was also interesting that this was the repair that got me finally started on that Amstrad Diagnostics ROM. So I hope you enjoyed that glimpse at some of the software development. And if you enjoy that, let me know. I may talk about some of my future um, Z80 and just in general retro development as well. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the episode. If so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.